the ceiling mics rather. So what we're going to do is I'm going to get Phil an intro and then we're probably going to mute these mics to keep the chatter down. And then Phil will go. And at the end, we'll have you guys um, ask questions. And if you're online, you have questions, you can, you can put them in the chat box. That's usually a good way. And then we can kind of roll through those at the end of the meeting. So um, that's how we'll do that. <clears throat> so, so yeah, Phil Harrington needs no introduction, but I'm going to give him an introduction. Um, you know, he's a, he's a very acclaimed amateur. Everybody knows Phil in our community. Um, he has done great work for astronomy magazine. I think he's written like a, like nearly 200 articles over, over the past, you know, generation or so. Um, he's an avid, uh, he's got an observing challenge on cloudy nights. That website, uh, many of you have probably done that as part of uh, just to astronomy. Um, he's a prolific author. I've got a book of his right here, my Eclipses. Um, and there's many more. He's got a book on bicycle riding, so he does a lot of everything. He's, uh, he is uh, an adjunct professor up there at uh, Suffolk County in New York, and he's been a director of planetariums up in New York. He's got engineering degrees. I mean, what, what more can we say? I think the best thing, Phil, for you is you're about to retire. Is that right? That's the best news I, I could tell you right now. That's the important thing. I got nothing I'm counting. Hang on a minute. I got an app for that. Um, I have uh, 53 days, 20 hours, 49 minutes, and 22 seconds. Not that I'm counting, uh, but I am anyway. So, Phil, it's a terrific having you kick us, kick us off this year, and especially with the topic of the eclipses that uh, we're all interested in. So I'm going to turn it over to you, sir, and uh, thank you. Great. Well, thank, thank you, Paul. Thank you, everybody, for, for showing up. I'm, I'm really impressed with the numbers. Over 100 people, uh, 89 on online, and, and I, I'm not too sure how many is in the, the audience there, but uh, I'm, I'm really uh, really flattered by that on a Sunday evening. Uh, to talk about a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, eclipses. As a matter of fact, it was a, an eclipse, a lunar eclipse, not a solar, but a lunar eclipse that pulled me into astronomy in the first place. Those of you who are old enough to remember, you may recall there was a total lunar eclipse on Good Friday in April of 1968. And my sixth grade science teacher, Mr. Clark, um, assigned us to look at it. We had the day off, and his policy always was never to assign homework over a weekend. So we had the day off being Good Friday, so we were looking forward to a, a three-day weekend. And But he said, no, no, no. He said, not so fast. He said, there's going to be a lunar eclipse, totally lunar eclipse tomorrow night. He's telling us this on, on that Thursday. And he said, I want you to view it and write a report, and it'll be due on Monday. The only way you'll get out of this, he told us, was if it's cloudy. Well, of course, we were all hoping it was going to be cloudy, and darn it, it was clear. So we had to go outside and look at this eclipse, and I, I still don't, I can't explain even to this day. Something just, I became mesmerized by it, and and that was sort of the spark that lit all this. Uh, so you never know if you're, you're a teacher, and I'm happy to say that I am now adjunct professor, such as it is. You never know what damage you might do to a student by assigning them to to you know do something, whatever that something is. In my case, it was the lunar eclipse. But um, so eclipses have been a, a, a huge driver behind me uh, since I first got involved with astronomy back in the the innocent days of of 1968. So I want to talk about the next great American eclipse, or I should say, wait a minute. I should say, can we go to the next slide? Should be able to. Now, why can't I do that? Oh, I see why. I'm looking at the wrong screen. Okay. Um, or eclipses. There we go. Eclipses, because what I want to do is I want to do a survey of all of the solar eclipses that will be touching some part of North America between now and the end of the century. Okay. So I know we're focusing a lot on just 15 months from now, 15 months to the day. April 8th, 2024, many of us are going to be somewhere along this line that goes from Texas up to Maine. I'll talk about that, certainly, as we get into this. But there are many other eclipses coming along that are going to capture our attention as, as well. So I want to focus in on those just sort of to make your travel plans for the next, well, the next century, at least. Okay. So we're going to begin, of course, let's go back one. Many of those pictures, they were outstanding photos, by the way, uh, that you shared. Uh, many of them were taken from the 2017 eclipse uh, that was the Great American Eclipse, the first total solar eclipse 
to cross the continental United States since, what was it, 1979, I think? And that was the track that it followed, uh, starting, of course, on the West Coast and moving diagonally to the Southeast across the country, uh, popping out into the Atlantic right by Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, so you and I, many of you and I, were somewhere along this, this line. Um, me, just to tell you a little bit about my story, I wanted to turn this into the ultimate family vacation. That was the idea. And so, therefore, we weren't going to be flying anywhere, although I originally thought maybe Wyoming, but I thought, no, 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 let's, let's make this an event as opposed to just a trip to see an eclipse. And so uh, my daughter, uh, Helen, who um, is just the greatest trip planner at all, of all, she found a website called roadtrippers.com, and that's my first bit of advice. If you're going to be driving somewhere to see the 2024 eclipse, again, you want to make it an event as opposed to just a trip to an eclipse. And so that's what she did. She, she set out this. I live on, on uh, central Long Island on the, the North Shore, and we follow this path, as you can see, and the different stops that you see, number one, two, three, and so forth, uh, various stops along the way because we rented this big old van. I call it the Harrington Family Truckster. Uh, with a nod to um, National Lampoon's vacation, uh, because it was going to be quite the thing, because my wife and I were going along, my daughter and her husband, and our two grandchildren were going, Jack and Hannah. Well, Hannah was uh, not quite nine months old, and Jack was, uh, well, he's about 14 months older than her, so he was still not quite two years old, as a matter of fact, and they were going to be going on this trip with us. And I thought this could work out really well, or this just could be an unmitigated disaster. But uh, Helen really planned the trip out meticulously, stopping at all these places, interested, interesting for the kids as well as for us along the way uh, in this rented um, uh, van. Uh, we stopped at Gettysburg, for instance. We didn't take a lot of time to do a tour of the battlefield, but still we went to the visitor center and so forth. Uh, we then traveled you know, through the park itself to a degree as best as we could given our, our schedule. And just that trip alone really knocked out Jack, as you can see on the right over here. Hannah was sort of taking it easy with water. But um, the kids just love this as we go along. We then went all the way down. We jumped a, a day or two later. We got to Lexington, Kentucky, found an arboretum, which uh, being a nature lover as I am, I, I just love that place. That was I've never been to an arboretum like that that they have in Lexington, Kentucky. It was absolutely gorgeous. And, of course, the weather, as you can see, was beautiful as well. Uh, Jack took up fishing, as you can see on the, the left over here, and Hannah just liked to, on the right, just liked to run around in the, the leaves and so forth that they had. Um, we then went to the Parthenon in Nashville, which was a, a tremendous trip as well. A great stop there, certainly uh, Music City as it is. But we actually, then we went to Dollywood, I should say, which uh, I was very impressed with uh, Dollywood. I really was. If you're looking for just a general, decent family type amusement park that was a great stop for us to to make as well hannah really got a face full of water with a splash park that they had there but that was a lot of fun certainly as well um we saw this we actually went to dollywood after the eclipse and a couple days after we could see the way the waxing crescent moon just coming up in the uh the western sky as the sun was going down it was going down the western sky i should say other ports of call we went to, we, we went to uh, oh, various, uh, this is where Barbara Mand Mandrell lived, uh, her home. Uh, we went on various hiking trails in the Blue, R Blue Ridge Mountain, went to Luray Caverns, um, went to, well, okay, they weren't all hits, but <laughs> Dinosaur Land in New Jersey. That was sort of a miss. But uh, it was just a, a wonderful thing. But, of course, the, the eclipse itself we saw in Clarksville, Tennessee. Okay, we took the last last train to Clarksville, I guess, and uh, met up with some friends of ours from Pennsylvania as well as Massachusetts, and uh, we all just had a, a wonderful time together. We stayed in a uh, very nice hotel. It was called the, the uh, Candlewood Suites, and we actually set up in a small area of their property uh, with various, well, you can see canopy set up because it was pretty warm, certainly, um, you know, various uh, other, you see telescopes, obviously, and chairs and and whatnot uh, we set up actually in a, a pet walking area so we had to walk kind of kind of gingerly in some of those spots but it was a a, a beautiful location for the eclipse i had a celestron six a c6 schmidt cast grain along with a uh, a zoom lens 300 millimeter zoom lens attached to the other camera that you see over on the the um, right hand side of the photo each on the same same basic tripod it's a manfrotto real heavy duty uh tripod that i've been using for eclipses since 1991 
as a matter of fact, down in Baja, California. Uh, the forecast, Clarksville was kind of funny because we weren't too sure how clear is it going to be. Uh, some forecasts, well, I shouldn't say forecast. If you take a look at climatological data, which is what I tried to do, I was trying to be a student of that, of course, when planning where I'm going to be going, climatological data didn't look all that promising. You wanted to be out west, Wyoming and so forth. That's where the clear skies were. But we couldn't drive out to Wyoming, so I thought, okay, we're going to try, and I just landed in Clarksville, Tennessee, because it was pretty close to the maximum eclipse point, maximum duration, I should say. And so we thought, we'll give that a go. Well, as luck would have it, couldn't, couldn't have been better. It wasn't a cloud in the sky. And I'm not too sure you know, exactly what we did to deserve that, but it was a beautiful view of the eclipse itself. Uh, put together kind of a nice montage of some of the photos uh, that, I, that I put together. But um, just real quickly, you can see the eclipse beginning, just beginning a little bit of a bump toward around 2 o'clock or so on the, the disk of the sun. And then, of course, more and more of the sun was being covered up by the moon until we end up with totality, which was just as astonishing. What a, a wonderful view. And I've seen a few total solar eclipses. They never get old. In fact, I know like Fred Espinak, for instance. Uh, Fred has seen, I don't know how many, you know, a couple of dozen eclipses. I don't even know what the number is now at this point. And he, he'll say the same thing. It never gets old. It's just absolutely beautiful, beautiful event. Um, shorter exposure, some of the prominences, uh, such as toward the, the right-hand side, about the 3, three o'clock position was a very nice loop prominence. Uh, and so forth, there's a close-up view of it, as well as another one down toward the bottom uh, as well. And we have the end of the eclipse coming. You see a little brightening toward the, the right-hand edge or limb of the moon as the moon is moving off the, the uh, sun's disk. And we have a really nice display of um, Bailey's beads. And that was the end of that. So anyway, that was, that was again, some of the, the photos I took. That's the curse of digital photography. You end up taking so many photographs, you don't know, you know which ones are the best. Uh, so that took a while to put, put it together. But to me, although I took some, I think, well, I, for me at least, some nice photos of the eclipse, the best pictures I took of the eclipse had to be these two of my grandchildren. Because I put together this little gizmo over here using a couple of surplus lenses that would project a magnified view of the sun, as you can see the, the um, crescent over there, onto just a little, it was just poster board, actually, on a piece of plywood. And Jack and Hannah were just mesmerized by that. And uh, Jack, you see, he's, he's about two at this point. He's now seven. Uh, but uh, he, was, he was really getting into it. So uh, I'm trying to talk them into now saying, okay, coming up in 2024, we're going to see it all over again. They don't remember this, of course, but they do remember it by the photographs. And that's the thing. Again, I want to make it a family event. And to that end, it, it worked miraculously, really, for all of us. So it was more than an eclipse, but trying to pull in the kids especially into some interest, uh, I think it was a, a great success. Well, that was 2017. And, of course, as soon as 2017 ended, I immediately start to think, okay, what's next? And as you can see from this map from greatamericaneclipse.com, uh, we have a lot of eclipses going across the country, going across the continent, between now and the end of the century. We've gone through kind of an eclipse drought here in North America. Uh, certainly, tw again, 1979 was the last total solar eclipse across, across the U.S., and it wasn't until 2017 that we had another one. So, we, like I say, we've gone through kind of a drought. Well, fortunately, the 21st century is going to be a little bit better than the end of the 20th century was. So let's take a look at what we have in store. Of course, April 8th, 15 months from now, 2024, that's what everybody is talking about, certainly. And you want to be somewhere along this line as it crosses the Rio Grande from Mexico. We go through a number of pretty major population centers, as you can see, from Texas through Arkansas, Indiana, Ohio, uh, New York, uh, Niagara Falls, for instance, Buffalo, uh, Rochester, Syracuse, and so forth, uh, Burlington, Vermont, across northernmost Maine, and it goes to um, New Brunswick and, and Newfoundland uh, eventually. You want to be somewhere along that line, but of course the question is, so where are you going to be? I know you're talking about having a planning meeting. I'm kind of going through the same process right now. Where do I want to be? Again, I want to be driving. I don't want to fly. I was originally thinking maybe going to Texas. I don't want to do that. I want to try to recreate the, the same emotional trip that we had back in 2017. 
So, of course, now I start to look at weather and so forth. And here's just a, a view of average, okay, just averages of what you have in April across the country. And you see from the key in the bottom right-hand corner here, you want to obviously go where there's blue. Okay, well, there is no blue. That's the problem. Okay? None, of the, none of the track, none of the eclipse track in, in 2024 is a definite clear, as you can see. As a matter of fact, a lot of the colors would seem to indicate, especially up here toward the northeast, those grays. Well, the grays are really poor. They're really poor. Um, the lighter grays toward, let's say, Indiana, uh, Illinois, uh, Missouri, they're a little bit better. Uh, you go down more toward, let's say, Little Rock and so forth, that's a little bit better still. And Texas, likewise, a little bit better still. So where do you want to go? Do you want to fly or do you want to drive? Well. Here's a, a quick overview of some of the spots along the way. And again, a little bit closer snapshot as to the possible sky conditions. Of course, a friend of mine went to Charleston, South Carolina. Against all odds, it was supposed to be cloudy in Charleston. He had a beautiful view of it, of the eclipse in 2017, where there, was, there were other areas that were supposed to be clear and people were clouded out. So you can't, you can't always bet on anything. But here we start going over the Rio Grande River over here. First stop. Kerrville, Texas, right along the center line. Greatest eclipse, that's to say the longest duration of totality, is going to be in Mexico. Okay? But if you don't want to cross into Mexico, that's fine. And you want to get as close to the Mexican border as you, you possibly can. And that would seem to, if you're going to fly, that would seem to indicate San Antonio is going to be the place you're going to fly into. And then Kerrville, right along the center line, has a uh, maximum eclipse duration of, of 4 minutes and 24 seconds. So that's not too bad. Uh, certainly, it's going to be longer there than anywhere else along the track in the in the U.S. Here are some of the <clears throat> excuse me some of the odds for the clear skies. How do you read this along the forget the the right hand um, uh, vertical table um, uh, values rather? Take a look at the left from zero percent up to one hundred percent. Well, the blue that you see, if you can see my cursor moving back and forth, the blue that's clear, whereas the lighter blue is mostly clear. The the sort of lightish gray is partly cloudy. The mostly cloudy and then totally overcast. Well, you see toward Kerrville, Tennessee, the way you can read this, it looks like you have about a 50-50 chance of at least being mostly clear. That's pretty good, 50-50. Again, not a 100% bet. A lot of people think you go to the southwest and it's going to be clear because drier conditions and so forth. Not always. Okay, it's Certainly not in the spring. See, that's the, the kick is the time of year. If we go a little bit far along to Waco, Texas, Four minutes and 12 seconds totality. So a little bit less than Kerrville. And the odds are roughly the same, about a 50-50 shot. Maybe a little bit better if you want to do partly cloudy. Okay, Partly cloudy, you have about a 60% chance of it being at least partly cloudy, if not better, in Waco. We move along a little bit farther. We get to Dallas, Dallas-Fort Worth. Both are in um, the... Uh, uh, band of totality, the path of totality, not the center line. And so you're going to have a three minute, 50 second totality in Dallas. Take a look at the coloring again. Well, once again, it's around, you know, the 60 ish or so percent, a little bit better, uh, give or take a little bit uh, toward Dallas as well for at least partly cloudy skies. Go to Little Rock, Arkansas, two minutes, 32.6 seconds totality. And there, once again, you're looking about 50-ish or so percent odds of, of clear, at least partly cloudy or better skies. Move a little bit more toward the northeast now. And let's stop in Indianapolis. Three minutes, 48 seconds for totality. And now notice how that line is dropping. It's going to be dropping down. Okay, you're going to get a, a bigger chunk of the mostly to totally overcast skies and less of a chance for partly cloudy skies. And it's going to be pretty much a repeat as you go farther northeast. You get toward um, Cleveland, Ohio, down over here. Three minutes and 48 seconds, almost on the center line. So that's not too bad for Cleveland. But again, take a look at the, the odds. Now we're down toward 40% for partly cloudy or better skies. Get to Buffalo. Beautiful downtown Buffalo. Center line goes right across it very nearly right across it. Uh, three minutes, 45 seconds. Not too bad. Certainly better than we had in 2017. But again, we're looking at 
your best bet for at least partly cloudy skies. If you're looking for clear, now you talk about 20% chance. Likewise, in Rochester, sort of the same numbers, three minutes, 39 seconds for totality. And again, you're talking about a 30-ish or so percent chance of partly cloudy skies. Keep, keep it going farther along. Syracuse, which is right on the edge, southern edge of the uh, path of totality, only a minute, 28 seconds. And again, kind of low odds for clear skies. Farther along, Burlington, uh, Vermont, three minutes, 14 seconds. Well, now, because you're getting farther away from Gray's Eclipse, the number's going down. You're off center line here anyway by Lake Champlain. And again, kind of low. And it's going to be that way as we keep on going. Okay, keep on going uh, across into Fredericton, uh, New Brunswick. Only two minutes, 16 seconds. And now it's also maybe 20, 30% or thereabouts for cl partly cloudy skies. And finally, we leave Prince Edward Island when it goes into the Atlantic. And again, kind of low odds. So where do you want to be to see this eclipse? Well, that's, you know, that's the magic question, right? Where do you want to be? What am I thinking? Right now, I'm not too sure. I'll be honest with you. And I wasn't in this position in 2017. In 2017, 15 months before the eclipse, I knew exactly where I was going to be in Clarks Clarksville. As a matter of fact, I even had reservations. I, I got no I have no reservations this time and my only reservations are where am I going to go? I don't know. I'm thinking toward Indiana. I'm thinking toward Indianapolis, maybe toward Missouri because they're right near each other. Uh, someplace again where we could drive. I don't want to have a, a real long road trip. The one we had to Tennessee was long enough. I don't want to go much farther than that just because of various family dynamics. I don't want to do that. So I'm still thinking. Okay, but I'm thinking right now toward Indiana, uh, possibly Ohio, although there, Ohio's better odds of clouds than Indiana. So I'm, I'm thinking more toward Indiana, maybe Missouri, like I say. Anyway, so that's that's my thought process for 2024 right now. Um, I'd be interested in hearing what you have to say. You know, maybe at the end we'll talk about, mention some of our questions. So we could take a look at, at some of the questions or comments, thoughts that you have. I'd like to learn from you. Where, where are you thinking of going? And, um, you know, and so on. So what if, though, let's look at what history tells us. What if the eclipse happened in uh, 2018, April 8th, 2018? Well, there's the path of totality going from, again, Texas all the way up through New England. And you can see, except for this big old swath in the middle, it was clear. It was clear up in, in Buffalo, 2018, perfectly clear. Here we have uh, parts of Ohio up over here, so forth and so on. There's Buffalo itself. It was perfectly clear. It got a little bit cloudy up there in New England, but uh, that's pretty good. Well, okay, what about just this past year? Well, now it's just the opposite. Now we have the only the only place, if the eclipse took place April 8, 2022, we all would have been clouded out, except for those down toward Arkansas and Texas. They had clear skies. And a little bit of a break over here. Okay, and... No, it's right around Erie, Pennsylvania, and Buffalo. As a matter of fact, maybe have partly cloudy skies. But look at Indiana, I would have been skunked. Ohio, forget it. Uh, and so forth. So that's it's worth looking at to see what it's going to be like this year, April 8th. Again, you can't draw any conclusions. It's just interesting to see how it plays out. Okay, but it's things to things to be looking for. Things to be looking for. Well, of course, you know, what about this October? There's going to be an annular eclipse going across the country. And you see the path that it's following right now, coming onto the um, uh, west coast over here and going diagonally southeast until it finally goes into the Gulf of Mexico. If you've ever seen an annular eclipse, and this particular sequence shot I took uh, back in 1994, because there was an annular eclipse visible across portions of Vermont, specifically Stellafane up in Springfield. Cellophane wasn't exactly on the center line, but I thought, what a what a wonderful place to see an annular eclipse. So in uh, 1994, a couple of friends of mine and I, we arranged things with the Springfield Telescope Makers to view the eclipse from, from Cellophane. And talk about a historic and emotional event because, well, Cellophane's been a part of my life since I nearly got involved with astronomy. My first Cellophane convention was back in 1969. This, this past year, uh, 2022, was my 50th convention. And so cellophane has been a real part of my life, going from a, 
a, a, a 13 year old kid up to a, a grandfather now. And so seeing that eclipse at Stella fame was a very emotional experience for me and one that I won't soon forget, but coming up in October of this year, 14th, let's take a look. If anybody's planning on seeing it, you might go to Eugene, Oregon. So, uh, annularity itself will last almost four minutes. So that's not too bad. Uh, if you go to Albuquerque, annularity is almost five minutes long. That's a long annular phase of, of um, uh, this eclipse. A little bit farther along, San Antonio, four minutes and 14 seconds as well. So if you're going to see this annular eclipse, you probably want to go somewhere along the middle you know, somewhere toward Albuquerque, if you're looking for maximum duration of annularity, Albuquerque is right smack on the center line of it. So that would be a good a good place to consider, certainly, as well. Corpus Christi, just as it breaks into the, the um, Gulf of Mexico there, five minutes of annularity, also a great place, because right, again, right on the center line. So Corpus Christi, Texas, would be a, a great location for this as well. But this is the place to be because the two paths cross the October eclipse, annular eclipse, which goes from in my map over here, upper left to lower right. And then the April 2024 eclipse, which goes from lower left to upper right. That's where you want to be, where they cross. Looking for a vacation home, looking for real estate, Leaky, Texas. <laughs> That's the place to go. That's where the paths cross, Leaky, Texas. So. See if you can come up with a, uh, a rental property there, maybe, and have it last from October to April, and you'll have two eclipses uh, for the price of one. Not too bad. What are the odds of that? Not very good, but there it is nonetheless in leaky, lovely leaky Texas. Some other eclipses we have coming up, touching North America. Well, we have one coming up in 2033, March 30th, to be exact, but take a look at where that is. We have Nome, Alaska is the place to be there. Okay. We're going to have totality lasting two and a half minutes or so. Unfortunately, the odds of clear skies are, again, pretty dismal there. I mean, you do have about maybe not quite a 20% chance of clear skies. Okay. It's, it's predominantly cloudy that time of year up in, in Alaska, unfortunately. Um, you can see the average temperature. You know, you're talking about 17 degrees, 19 degrees. So make sure you dress for it if you're going up there. Um, this is just talking about the solar elevation. Now, the sun's going to be very low in the sky and max 20 degrees above the horizon. So you have to have a good view, certainly in that direction, to uh, get a good a good um, view of the eclipse. And, of course, Nome, home to the Iditarod. So maybe that's how you're going to get there. I'm not too sure how you're going to be able to get into to Nome, Alaska, but there there are ways, certainly. In August 23rd, August 23rd, 2044, we have a total eclipse that goes across Canada. So it touches Calgary, for instance, and then swings just into the U.S. So we have Edmonton, Alberta is in the path of totality, not the center line, but the path of totality. Only a minute, 25.9 seconds. Calgary is much better. Well, I shouldn't say much. That's overstatement. One minute, 49 seconds. So it's going to be a very short uh, totality. And into the U.S., Great Falls, Montana, totality will only last 23 seconds. It goes right on the very edge of the um, path, of path of totality. And it's going to be pretty close to sunset as well. So it's going to be very low in the sky. Only Look at this, at maximum eclipse, only five degrees above the horizon, according to this um, chart that I have. The next great American eclipse after 2024 will actually be in the year 2045. Okay, August 12th, 2045. Now, I don't know about you. I'm planning on being around for this. Okay, my grandchildren will have to wheel me. Okay, but I plan on being around for this, if at all possible. It follows, in many respects, a very similar profile as the 2017 eclipse because it crosses the West Coast right over here and then in next toward the southeast, like so. But take a look at some of the places it crosses. Redding, California, over here, 
so forth and so on down to Nevada, Utah, Colorado, a lot of big population centers along the way, Denver, Colorado Springs, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, Tulsa, Tallahassee, Florida, Orlando, Miami, will all be along the path of totality. We have one here, Redding, California, four minutes, 24 seconds. Not too, not too bad for that one, uh, certainly. You go a little bit farther along to Reno, not quite on the center line, actually closer to the southern limit. So it's going to be relatively short, two minutes and 54 seconds for totality. We continue east from Nevada. We cross into Utah. Salt Lake City is just inside the path, as you can see. Provo, a little bit to its south, is a little bit better off. Still not on the center line by any means, but it's going to still be a four-minute eclipse, four minutes, 16 seconds. It's going to be a long one. Grand Junction, Colorado, five minutes, almost dead on the center line. Again, all this is August, August 12th, 2045. Farther east still, Colorado Springs, five minutes and five seconds, about 4.9 seconds. Oklahoma City, because it's on the edge, only three minutes. Obviously, you want to get to the center line if at all possible. Tulsa, five minutes, 36 seconds, rounding it up a little bit. Then we get toward the southeast, Montgomery, Alabama, three minutes, 51 seconds. Tallahassee, five minutes again, 49 seconds. We're getting closer to greatest eclipse, which is right over here in Florida. It's going to cross Walt Disney World. Okay, it's going to cross Walt Disney World. Um, I've been to Walt Disney World with my family. I can't tell you how many times. We, we just like the place. Although I'm sorry to lose my interest in it because they're nickel and dime to death. But anyway, six minutes and two seconds from Walt Disney World. Main Street, USA, six minutes and two seconds. So you can imagine seeing this, but instead of seeing Spaceship Earth with the full moon rising over it, a photograph I took some years ago, you're going to see a totality over Spaceship Earth in Epcot. That'd be a pretty cool photo opportunity, I would think. As a matter of fact, I came up sort of half tongue-in-cheek with a Facebook group called the, the Great Walt Disney World Eclipse. So I didn't invite people to join it. You know, so again, it's tongue in cheek. 2045. Let's see. 2045, I'm going to be 89 years old. Okay. So I don't know. Will I see that? I'm going to try you know, best as I could do. But uh, it's going to be 76 degrees above the horizon. The sun that is the altitude. 76 degrees above the horizon. Six minutes and two seconds of totality. Wow. Grace Eclipse actually would be very close to Port, St. Port St. Lucie, six minutes and six seconds. So a smidge longer, a couple of seconds longer than we'll have at Disney World. March 30th, 2052, we have an eclipse that just touches a little bit of Texas before it crosses Gulf of Mexico, hits a little bit of New Orleans, and then goes more toward uh, Alabama. It is going to just nick Brownsville, Texas with a two minute, three second duration of totality it's going to nick south of new orleans boothville tennis louisiana with a three three minute 28 second totality very flat area okay so that'd be an ideal place to go because you have very little uh, in the way of trees blocking the view then it's going to cross over florida georgia and so forth i mentioned pensacola for instance panama city florida three minutes 26 seconds Savannah, three minutes, 29 seconds, almost three and a half minutes uh, there. Charleston, South Carolina. Many people saw the eclipse in 2017 from Charleston, South Carolina. Here's another one. Okay. Uh, two minutes, 46 and a half seconds duration for this one. 2052. Are we going to make it? I don't know. Another annual eclipse coming up November 15th, 2077. And it crosses Eugene, Oregon, and so forth, going across is Albuquerque, just outside of the, the path of annularity. And it goes across Austin, Texas, Houston, and then into the Gulf. So Eugene, Oregon, again, long duration of annularity. Likewise, Santa Fe, New Mexico. And Abilene, Texas, 6 minutes, 22 seconds, just about. Houston, 6 minutes, 12 seconds. 
So a lot of great eclipses coming up. You know, we should live so long to see them. I'm talking mostly to the younger folk here, um, the real younger folk. You know, if you're talking about 2079, for instance. Again, Brownsville, though, sees it again. Total solar eclipse. Okay, two minutes. Grace eclipse is over here, actually, in the Gulf. But New Orleans, five minutes and 17 seconds of uh, totality. It'll then crisscross across uh, Georgia, Alabama. Once again, see Montgomery, Alabama, Atlanta, Georgia. We'll see it. Four minutes, 42 and a half seconds. Keep on going across to Raleigh. Four minutes, 30 seconds. Raleigh right over here. And Nags Head, North Carolina, right on the Outer Banks over there. Five minutes, 16 seconds. This is the one that kills me. This one here. May 1st, 2079. Okay, May 1st, 2079. I would be 123 years old. Okay. <laughs> 123 years old. I mentioned I live on Long Island. Right? Here is the very wide path of totality. Here's the center line right along Long Island. It's going to parallel the Long Island Expressway. So we'll call it the Great Long Island Expressway Eclipse. Okay. Take a look at some of the cities that will be in totality. Well, first off, it's going to be a sunrise eclipse. You ever see a sunrise eclipse? I saw one in 2021. This uh, I took this photograph just from a beach looking across Long Island Sound here. The sun came up. Obviously, it was a partial eclipse. It was a gorgeous sight. Absolutely gorgeous. Unless I traveled, I'll probably be the last sunrise eclipse I ever see. And it was just spectacular. Well, should I live to 2079, I would see a total solar, a total eclipse of the sun rising that particular morning. Imagine a total solar eclipse rising in the morning. What an amazing event that, that might be. But we take a look. Hartford, Connecticut, two minutes, two seconds of totality. Look at the altitude. Maximum eclipse, 2.6 degrees above the horizon. Providence, Rhode Island, 2 minutes, 11 seconds of totality, 3.5 degrees above the horizon, and maximum eclipse. Boston, 2 minutes and 5 seconds, 4 degrees above the horizon. But I'm not going to, I wouldn't go to Hartford or Providence or Boston to see this eclipse. Uh-uh. I'd go in my backyard because my house, where I am right now, is right on the center line. Right on the center line. You know, so that's me. <laughs> that's my expression. Right on the center line. Two minutes and 10 seconds. Okay? It will only be 1.9 degrees above the horizon and maximum eclipse. So I wouldn't see it from my house because I have a couple of trees in the, in, that, in the easterly direction. But I could go down to the water. And the beauty of living on Long Island is you have water both you know, on all sides of you. So you can get a good view. Uh, one way or the other. Probably to the same beach where I took that partial eclipse photo you saw just a moment ago. Because uh, it's a good view in that direction of sunrise that particular time of year. So I'm telling my grandchildren, say, okay, write this down, put it on your calendar, May 1st, 2079. That's where you that's where you got it. You gotta see the eclipse. You gotta be in you gotta be here. Okay. We all live together. My grandchildren, my daughter, husband, my wife and I, we all live together. It's a three generation house. And they gotta come back here. They look at me, they're six and seven years old now. They look at me like, you know, what are you crazy? But you never know. We get toward the end of the century. There's going to be a total eclipse May 11th, 2097, right across Alaska. Okay. Prudhoe Bay, great place to go. Beautiful area, two minutes and 58 seconds of totality. September 14th, 2099, once again, right across the country. Like so, Grace Eclipse is going to be on the Atlantic, though. But you see some of the cities that it's going to pass through. Chicago is going to get to a total eclipse of 2099. Fargo will have a four-minute. Minneapolis will have a three-minute, 53-second. Milwaukee, four, minute and a half, four and a half minutes, roughly. And Chicago, only one minute, 52 seconds, because it's just on the very edge of the uh, path of totality. Columbus, Ohio, also, four minutes and 19 seconds and so forth. Then we get down toward Richmond, Virginia is going to be with four minutes and just over four minutes totality uh, and so forth. So those are some of the eclipses that we have coming up in the U.S., Canada, North American continent. 
between now and the end of the century. Uh, certainly the one in 2024 is going to draw a tremendous amount of attention. You could bank on it, the one in 2045, the next great American eclipse after after this one in 2024. We have to wait 21 years for it, admittedly. But that's going to imagine, imagine the hubbub that's going to take place in Florida, that particular date. And it's going to be just amazing. Literally everywhere across the country. Reno, Nevada, for instance, was another one in the past, for instance. Um, and these others will as well, certainly. Uh, the one in 2099, you know, we should live so long. But, um, uh, and some of the other ones as, as well, the cut across the southeast, across the Gulf of Mexico, and so forth and so on. Uh, those are also going to attract a, a huge amount of attention. Um, don't know if any of you are old enough. I was only seven years old, and I was interested in astronomy at the time. But anybody remember the 1963 eclipse? There was a total eclipse of the sun that actually only crossed, it was predominantly in, in um, Canada. It crossed a part of Alaska. That's true. It went from Asia into Canada, into Alaska, then across Canada, and only went through Maine. That was the only one of the continental states that it crossed. But it still attracted a huge amount of attention. People traveled from all points in, up to Maine to see the eclipse. It attracted so much attention in the press that if you're familiar with the the, the Peanuts comic strip with Charlie Brown and Linus and Snoopy and so forth, uh, the cartoonist Charles Schultz devoted an entire week of um, comics to the event. I'd like to just show them to you. This, be, this was in um, uh, July. Uh, Charlie Brown says, I hear there's going to be an eclipse of the sun this Saturday. And Linus, Linus was always, even though he was the kid with the blanket, the security blanket, he was always the intelligent one in the group. He says, uh, yes, but my ophthalmologist says it's very dangerous to look at. Well, I plan to use sunglasses, Charlie Brown says. Don't do it. Don't do it. Sunglasses, smoke glass, photographic negatives, even welder's glasses aren't safe for directly viewing an eclipse. So that was good. He was doing a, a public service announcement in this case. So Charlie Brown says, how would your ophthalmologist feel if I closed my curtains and stayed in bed all day? That's exactly what happened when we were down in um, 1984 saw a hybrid eclipse, an annual or total sort of a hybrid eclipse uh, just north of Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, some friends of mine and I, and we were listening to the radio stations down there, and many of the announcers on these radio stations warned parents, keep your children inside because it's going to be an eclipse of the sun. I couldn't get over the amount of misinformation that was being spread about this eclipse. The ignorance in the general public is is just it, it was astonishing at least down there it was i couldn't get over it and you know exactly what what bill says in the comment just now ordered inside to save our eyes many people think that there's some sort of a mystical power that comes across sunlight during an eclipse i don't know but a lot of people you know again said you know say my close my curtains and stay in bed all day long anyway the next day's panel now lucy who's linus's older sister um, Lucy was always a crab, you know, everywhere. She was always picking fights, especially with Linus. Um, so she said, what's this about not being able to look at the eclipse? Linus says, it's very dangerous. You could suffer severe burns of the retina from infrared rays. But what's the sense of having an eclipse if you can't look at it? Someone in production sure slipped up <laughs> this time, which is, which is kind of funny. It goes on now. The next day he said, I have another question about Saturday's eclipse of the sun. Will it be seen all over the country? And he comes back and says, no, only certain parts, certain areas rather will be able to see it. Lucy says, you wouldn't think it, that it was, you wouldn't think it was so difficult. Well, I'm sorry, I can't even read. You wouldn't think it was that hard to get bookings for an eclipse, would you? But then again, public service, what are you doing? Lucy asks. This is a projector for observing the eclipse tomorrow. There's no safe method to look directly at an eclipse and it's especially dangerous when there was a total eclipse. Well, of course, that's not, that's not true. We know that. But in any case, he goes on to say, therefore, I've taken two pieces of white cardboard and put pinhole a pinhole in one. This will serve to project the image onto the other board, see? And Lucy then says to Schroeder on the left, says, I bet Beethoven would never have thought of that. Schroeder was a, a pianist. He was a big um, big fan of Beethoven. That was sort of an, an ongoing gag in the, in the strip. Well, anyway, Eclipse Day shows up. And we see Lucy walk, out, walk outside. It's pouring outside. And as she progresses across the strip, 
She finds Linus out there in the pouring rain with his two pieces of cardboard for the uh, projection. And he, she says, so how's the eclipse? <laughs> Let's hope we don't have that problem in 2024 that Linus did back in 1963. So anyway, just to wrap this up, a quick look at some of the eclipses coming up in the rest of the 21st century. The one in 2024 is going to be just spectacular. Uh, if you get to see the annular eclipse this October, well, that's just icing on the cake. Uh, I'm going for just the, the total eclipse. I'll probably let the annular eclipse, uh, pass. I've seen a couple of them. I'll probably let that pass. But uh, the total eclipse definitely in 2024 is going to be just outstanding. And got to be in the right place. You know, play the odds with the weather. Who knows? Some, something you want to do. And in fact, a buddy of mine from Ohio mentioned this, even though it's going to pass not quite in his backyard, but it's going to be in his home state, Ohio. He said, here's what he's going to do. This is a pretty good idea. He said he's going to make two reservations, two points along the eclipse track, separated by a distance. So maybe he'd go toward Buffalo and maybe go down toward, I don't know, Indiana or somewhere along, uh, or Missouri. And then the eclipse week, he's going to make sure that he can, he can cancel one of the reservations without penalty. Then he's going to look at the weather, come up, you know, seven days, five days, whatever, before the eclipse. So he's going to know which direction to go. He's going to cancel the other reservation. He's going to go in the uh, in that direction toward the, where the clear sky is going to be. That's not a bad idea okay, to do that. At the same time, another thought, location, especially if you're going to be driving or at least have a rental car, certainly if you're flying, be near a, a major highway, that's to say an interstate, so that if it is cloudy where you are, you could jump into the car and hopefully drive maybe a few hundred miles one way or the other along the interstate. The, the interstate, if it, even better if it parallels roughly, parallels the path of totality to hopefully cl find clear skies as well. So that's another technique. Things like that. Have to come up with, you know, what's plan B? If where I'm going to be is going to be cloudy, you know, at the last minute, what's plan B? You have to have a plan B. We had a plan B in Tennessee. Thank goodness we didn't have to use it. We had to walk outside the hotel room. We were all set up. But plan B, we were going to try to hightail it out west, you know, toward Kentucky and out that way as best as we could. So, again, to think it through. It's great that the club is is looking at it from a community point of view because there's a lot of strength in that. Okay, so get together, talk talk amongst yourselves. Where do you want to go? Um, you know, maybe everybody won't go in the exact same location. But again, it, it's great to, you know, have other fellow club members act as a sounding board where you're going to go. So things like that. I really hope you get a chance to see this eclipse in just 15 months. The time to start planning is now. Absolutely start planning. I mean, tomorrow. Start thinking about where you're going to be going. And then beyond that, how you're going to get there. And then beyond that, where you're going to stay. Things like that. Normally hotels, at least the major chains, they don't take reservations more than one year out. Okay? But we got lucky in Clarksville. The hotel let us make a reservation two years out. I think they made a mistake, quite honestly. But um, And it wasn't crowded. We heard about all these these uh, horror stories of traffic jams. It wasn't crowded at all. So we were just plain dumb lucky when it came to, to seeing that eclipse in 2017. I really hope we get to, a chance to recreate it in uh, 15 months. And with that, I believe... Yep, that's my last slide. So I will uh, stop sharing and thank you for your attention and be happy to take any any questions that you might have. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Phil. Uh, uh, terrific presentation and really kind of set the stage for what we're going to do. It was a lot of planning over those months. Um, I will say I, I kind of had the con off that your friend did for that 2017. My two sons and I drove to Illinois knowing that Two days before the eclipse, we could go 500 miles in either direction and catch where the best weather was. And, you know, as it what turned out, we had it all, almost all the way back to the, uh, you know, uh, the eastern side of Tennessee. But uh, uh, in that case, we slept in a, you know, literally in a Walmart parking lot <laughs> because I didn't want to cancel. So it, there is there is some good comments on there. Uh, so we're going to take some questions. I, I want to start with the room first. Uh, uh, anybody have a question for Phil uh, about the planning, Alex? Yeah, I have one. Um, but where'd you get your cloud climatology numbers that you showed? 
Boy, that's a good question. I'd have to go back with my notes, which I, I, I can't do off the top of my head now exactly where I found that shoot. I don't remember. I, I think it was um, there's a national climate. I can't even say it now. National Climatological Data Center or something like that. I think that's where I found them. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was wondering, do you know of any group that has done or might be planning to possibly recreate the Eddington experiment using these eclipses? You know who who is? is uh, you're familiar with the name Richard Berry? Yes. Richard used to be editor of astronomy. He had telescope making, so forth and so on. Um, he is individually. Okay. Yeah, he's playing around with that right now. He posts on Facebook every now and then um what he's doing and uh, interesting stuff but yeah he he's involved with that can you tell us a little bit about that um the well, well the idea is sir arthur eddington he, he's the one who proved pretty much that einstein got it right that uh a an object of substantial mass could bend light and he did that by proving that uh, uh gravity of the um of the sun being so massive did bend light of stars that should have been behind the sun, but during a total eclipse, they were visible on you know to one edge or the other of the sun. So because of the the bending of the light by the sun's gravity. Yeah, he took a photograph of where the um, yeah. night sky before the, the the basically I guess six months before the eclipse and then during the eclipse. So he saw the basically the same star field, and he measured the angular distances between the stars, and uh, relativity will give you a prediction as to how far away the stars will move away from each other based on the mass of the of the sun and so yeah you can you can do it I, uh, a colleague of mine brad schaefer was trying to do it for 2017 but that plans kind of fell through so i'm just wondering if folks were thinking about doing it for the upcoming yeah i, I seem to recall hearing hearing richard say something about that yeah oh yeah i got one too yeah so um the what was the, the little contraption you made for your grandkids? That's for? a neat little thing, isn't it? It was yes. I read about it online <laughs> and a, a fellow came up with this idea. He he got a couple of lenses from um what was the surplus optical place? What's that the name of that now? Surplus shed. Surplus shed, that's what it was, surplus shed. And uh anyway, so he posted plans on um online and someone told me about it. And I looked down and said, Wow, that's really interesting. So I wrote to him, the fellow who posted it, and uh you know, he and I went back and forth a little bit about it, and it, it worked really well. So for he ended up spending about eight bucks on optics or ten bucks on optics, and a couple of pieces of you know just half inch plywood I used, and um, and a can of yellow Krylon paint because I happen to like yellow, and it, it worked really well. So if anybody is if anybody is interested in, in in learning more about it, I have a bookmark someplace. I, I assume it's still good. I don't know that for a fact, but shoot me an email. Okay, okay, let me give you my address is Phil Phil dot Harrington at hotmail.com. Please don't sign me up for any political <laughs> special interest groups. I don't want to hear about that. But um yeah, just shoot me an email and I'll I'll if if I have and I think I do, I can send it to you. Thank you. Anybody sure. else in the room? Yeah, Cal. Yeah, Phil, Cal here. Uh any hey, Cal. Uh, how are you doing? Wonderful. How are you? Very good, thanks. Uh, any uh, plans on doing a new uh, edition of your Eclipse book? No, you mean you mean this Eclipse book right here, Cal? Okay, let's I see. mean this one right here, Phil. This one, oh, okay, that one also it looks almost the same. No, I can't say I have this. This book, uh, actually, the, the book I just held up that Cal's talking about, um, I that came out uh, not long. I started to write, actually, not long after the 91 Eclipse because I was so moved by it. I thought, you know, I got to come up with a guide about eclipses. Because there were a few out at the time, but nothing that, that really went into the, the real nuts and bolts of the eclipses themselves. And so I, I it was a 20-year a overview of eclipses from 1997, all eclipses, not just not just North America, 1997 to 2017. And so the book kind of died in 2017. And uh, no, I can't say I am, Cal, but uh, there's a lot of good stuff online now that, you know, you don't really need this. So therefore, you know. I'm not going to bother. Uh, yeah, question. Yeah, not so much a question, but you, you've been, you mentioned the Good Friday eclipse, of, uh, lunar eclipse of 68. Uh, I, I remember our entire neighborhood in 
where we lived in Mississippi came out to view it. It was it was amazing. I don't think there was anybody in the neighborhood that wasn't out watching it. It was it was quite the event. And like I say, darn it was clear. I was I want to be inside watching TV. I mean, you know, 13 year old kid, would you want to do a 12 year old kid at the time? You know, I didn't want to be looking at any clips. But um yeah, it was it was spectacular. Spectacular. Yeah, Bill Dan here. Hey Dan. Hey uh my favorite eclipse views were through uh, Fujinon 16 by 70 binos with uh, solar filters during a partial phase and all. But the, the the view during totality through those binos just blew me away. Do you have a favorite view? Oh, yeah. And through binoculars, as a matter of fact. Um, I have, uh, I, I was using my 10 by 50s for that because I wanted to be able to, obviously, I'm taking pictures. But here's the thing about eclipses. If you've never seen an eclipse, what, what they were talking about earlier about you have to see it. You know the pictures are really pretty. These videos are really dramatic. They they are so far from the real event. You can you can only experience an eclipse by witnessing it, because it's all inclusive. It's not just the eclipse itself. It's the environment changes. That's the thing. the 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 environment changes. Somebody mentioned before how animals get quiet. The temperature drops maybe 10, 15 degrees. Um, winds may pick up, but then they calm down. At least that's been my experience. So it's just uh, just an amazing um, emotional event. I mean, some people, are, you know, they see it, they, they, they weep over it. You don't know what emotion, if you've never seen a total solar eclipse, you don't know what emotion you're going to feel. Okay, you really don't until you actually witness it. Now, as I mentioned, I'm a, I'm a, a college professor. I've been doing that for a couple of decades now. And I always build, when I talk about eclipses, which is always chapter three um, in the book, I talk about eclipses, I always play up the next solar eclipse, okay, the next total solar eclipse. So I played up the 2017 eclipse for years and years and years with my class. Now I'm playing up 2024. But with 2017, it's amazing the impact you might have on students because I had, I received emails from students in the September of 2017 that they were in my class back in about maybe 20, 2011 or even, even 2010. They want they thank me for telling them about the eclipse because they saw it and they couldn't get over it. And they asked me, so when's the next one? So uh, again, it's it's this stuff is really contagious because as soon as you see one, you gotta see another one. <laughs> so if you've never seen a total solar eclipse, geez, what the heck are you waiting for? This one, 2024, is gonna be spectacular. Uh, let's see. Let's go. We might have a couple more in the room, but let me go sure. out and let's see. Phil, just bear with us for a little bit. I know we're a little over the hour. Um, uh, we got a lot of cool questions. So uh, sure. we'll start off with, with Chris, uh, Chris Payne. Uh, he, left. He, he was asking more about the uh, the averages. Maybe it was like uh, uh, Alan's question. Um, you can see the chat box too, Phil, but... Uh, uh, we'll skip past that one. A couple of folks have experiences they shared in the chat box, which is great. Um, someone's trying to make uh, reservations at Disney World already. I forget what <laughs> that is, but uh, looking for questions and see comments here. Uh, great presentation. Al, you got a question? Your hand. Al? Go to Al, Al Papson. Al Papson. Yeah, Al. Got to take it off mute. I don't know. Otherwise, let's see. Uh, Greg, you're on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Phil, thanks for the uh, presentation today. I've been Great. tracking both the uh, annular eclipse and have reservations in Albuquerque uh for the annular eclipse which i've never seen and i have reservations currently in lampasas texas which is basically on the center line uh for 2024 but as far as you're uh mentioning that most hotels won't uh most of the big chains mm -hmm. won't take a reservation uh farther out than 12 months i do find especially in the smaller towns if you call the hotel directly their policies and make sure you don't press one for reservations because that goes to the national uh you actually talk to the desk they can sometimes make an exception for you uh, that's interesting yeah and in that's fact um we 
We've got reservations of the best Western there. I passed it to a friend that I met in 2017 in Riverton, Wyoming. He got reservations. And then when his friend called, they said, oh, we're stopping that. We're reevaluating, which means they're going to raise prices. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, it, that's, that's tough. Rental cars and lodging are tough as well. So, um, but I appreciate it. Um, uh, that's a good tip though. Uh, but what I was going to ask really was, do you think that we will have an opportunity or is there someone that's going to lead an opportunity talking about some of the technical aspects? For example, uh, I see a lot of pictures of diamond ring, but all the guidance says don't take pictures with the filter removed once you start see, seeing the Bailey beads. Mm -hmm. and the next step is the diamond ring. So how do you take that picture if you can't take your... You, you got to take the filter off, obviously. Yeah, and, and that's that's what I do. I take the filter off. Is yeah, there a trick yeah. for that? Just pull it off. I mean, <laughs> nothing, nothing more basic than that, really. You know, the thing is, when do you take it off? That's, you know, that's maybe the trick. And it's just, I don't know, it's hard to quantify when you have when you have such a thin sliver of a crescent left. You know, that's when you get ready to pull the thing off quickly because you got to move, you got to move really quickly, obviously, because, you know, this, this uh, transitions from partial to Bailey's beads, diamond ring to totality very, very quickly. And so it's it's a matter of just sort of getting a feel for it and saying, okay, you know, now. Of course, the beauty is you're not looking directly at the sun, so therefore it's not going to hurt your eyes, right? You're not going to look through your camera. You're going to look, if you can, with, with the view screen in the back, for instance. You're not going to look directly through the lens. You look at the view screen. Okay. And so if you're looking at the view screen, I don't look at the view screen until, you know, the cows come home and it's not going to hurt my eyes. Okay, so, so that's the key. Don't look through the. Uh, don't look through the view screen. No, no, no. Always, if you're talking about, if you have a DSLR, like I, I run Canon. Okay, so yeah. you have a, a view screen in the back, and I can, I can have that project instead of looking through the, 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 um, prism directly. I'm looking at my view screen just by pushing a button, and that's how I'm what I'm going to okay. do. In 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 live view. Okay. Yeah, live view. Exactly. Exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. All right, but I, I think there may be some other questions that could pop up because I know the Espernac books all talk about basically film. And yeah, uh, and so does mine talk all about film too because back in 1997, that's what we were shooting. It hasn't been updated for digital yet. Okay. No, there, there are some. If you go online though, you could do just digital photography of eclipses and so forth. There, there, are, I'm sure you'll find lots of websites that'll discuss that. Okay. Well, thanks very much. I don't want to sure. monopolize your time, but thank you. Uh, uh, thank you for the topic. Yeah, thanks, Greg. There's a yeah, Bob Traub. I just put a put a little note in the chat box. You can kind of look at. Oh, I've heard of yeah, I've heard of that. I haven't. I'm I'm not familiar with a Eclipse uh, orchestrator. Yeah, I have. Um, I have heard of that. I, mean, I haven't used it. Yeah. Questions. So, um, so I guess I want to ask about. I get the idea about getting housing or camping or whatever, and say you're you're someplace near but not on the center line. So you want to move to the center line during the day, and I guess that I worry about you know you go to a pub, uh, you know some parks are going to be too jammed up and you know there's no bathrooms around or anything like that. Yep. Or you find someplace else. Somebody was telling a story about getting chased, almost chased off of an elementary school <laughs> playground or something like that. You know how do you what what is the I mean if I guess suppose it just varies with every spot of what what the protocol is to try to find a place to set up. No, well, yeah, I, I don't think there is a you want to stay off private property, obviously, unless you have permission to be there. But I'll tell you a really, really quick story. In nineteen ninety one, the July ninety one eclipse, I was at the very tip of Baja, California. Okay. And uh with a with an eclipse tour. Eclipse tour. And uh Twilight Tours it was called. Anyway, uh we were in La Paz. Was it La Paz? Is that the name of it? Anyway. Um Nice hotel, so forth and so on. That was great, but it wasn't on the center line. And we wanted to get, being the typical, you know, American hogs that we were, we wanted to get every possible second in totality. So the the um, orchestrator of the tour, uh, he arranged for a series of charter buses to go from where we were at this hotel to the middle of nowhere 
literally uh, desert in Baja, California to see it. And he had stuff set up. He had tents set up and he had all the comforts of home, more or less. Well, anyway, long story short, um, totality started. We had clear skies. Totality started. And the temperature dropped so quickly from the center line now. And we were on the east side of a mountain range. Well, hmm. the temperature dropped so quickly that the dew point was hit. Okay, wow. dew point was hit. Clouds formed. The prevailing winds brought the clouds down into the valley where we were. And halfway into the totality, we were clouded out. So instead of getting six minutes and something like 57 seconds of totality, we got about half that. Half that. Well, the people who weren't such gluttons as we were, who stayed back at the hotel, they had the full, I think it was five and a half minutes of totality. They saw shadow bands, everything else, and we saw clouds for half a totality. So, you know, I, I agree you want to get as much as you possibly can, but at the same time, you know, I learned a lot in 1991. I'm not going to be such a hog anymore. I'm going to take what I can get and uh, be happy with it because that was that was very disappointing. The question is, do you recommend you have to really scope out the exact place oh, yeah. you want to be yeah. for the eclipse, and that may not be necessarily right where your hotel or camping may place. not be. We were very lucky where we were in Clarksville. We didn't have to go more than about 40 right. feet from the door. So I'd like to do that again in uh, 24. We'll see. I found out from my experience in 2017, like I paid like 50 bucks at this one church camp in Illinois, but when I got there, the weather was not going to be good. So gave up on that. And I just, I they were parking cars in farm field. So they, they were field. advertising the church camp as a place to... Well, yeah, I, I had booked a spot there that I could set up, but uh, hmm. but I, you know, I gave up on that. I started driving east and just paid a guy twenty bucks. He was parking dozens and dozens of cars. He made a lot of money that day. But, <laughs> and everybody opened up their field for the spot, so it can vary a little bit. But uh, any other questions here in the room? Um, online, I think we went through a lot of the questions. Maybe all of them. Anybody else online? Uh, great turnout today. Um, there's a tremendous amount of interest in, in the event, obviously. Jill, you're great to help us uh, get started. Um, I checked hotels, too, and I couldn't get a hotel that far out yet. Um, so maybe calling directly would work. But uh, yeah. yeah, Gray made a good point, because that's actually what my wife and I always do, no matter what we're doing. We don't call the 800 number. We, we always call the hotel and talk to the front desk directly. Just in general, we do that. And um, that's also what we did in Clarksville in 2017. So we talked to them directly. So that's not a bad uh, bit of advice at all. So I, I thank you, Greg, for mentioning it. Yeah, that's a good tip. So, all right, last call. We got uh, some cool outreach coming up for the club later this month out of Crockett and Sky Meadows and Udmar Hazi. So three really terrific places. Always need volunteers with telescopes and uh, it's fun, fun places to me so uh phil thank you so much uh my pleasure right. thank you everybody okay. we'll try to get you in person one of these days like okay we'll do <laughs> we'll try to do that <laughs> okay. thank you so much and, okay uh, and thanks for coming to thank you everybody have a good night everybody thank you again bye. 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 yep thanks bye